Welcome to HEC TV's live interactive program that's part of St. Louis. The whole production is pulled together. It's going to be a steel bridge on the American classic novel. The, the car that put America on wheels. Welcome to HEC TV Live. Welcome to HEC TV Live, where today we're focusing on the science behind flight soaring the sky. And it's soaring, you're seeing right there in that video now, a sailplane. And we're going to talk about the science behind flight, what makes sailplanes happen, how are they designed, how do they operate, and how do they catch the thermals, those filling stations in the skies, to be able to go from place to place and fly. Hi, everybody. I'm Tim Gore, your host for HEC TV Live. And I'm very happy to welcome you to the airport outside of Highland, Illinois, where Mel Burkhardt, who's joining us, has his sailplane that you see right here. Mel, thanks so much for being here this morning. You're welcome. It's a pleasure of mine. Well, let's talk a little bit just about what we're seeing, just to give the students and everybody else a, a sense of this plane. In terms of its dimensions, what's its length? What's its wingspan? Well, it's, it's classified as a 15-meter sailplane, and uh, that's wingspan. Okay. So that our wingspan is about 50 feet, slightly less. It's about 22 feet in length. And it looks pretty light. Is it made of fiberglass? It is. It's a combination of fiber and carbon fiber, uh, similar to uh, most uh, boats that are made today. Okay. Now, today's a pretty day out here in Highland. Would this be a good day to go soaring? It would be. However, uh, we're waiting for the uh, uh, thermal lift to develop, which will probably occur later this afternoon, and I, we're going to talk about that shortly. So more than likely most soaring occurs later in the day as opposed to early in the day because of the need for that thermal lift yes and is that the same way it operates i just asked it crosses my mind st louis recently had the the forest park balloon race and the balloon race always happens in the late afternoon is it similar that they're searching for that same kind of thermal that they would do that in the afternoon no, the as well? balloon uh, is their gas balloons mm -hmm. which create the heat and so they use a uh, propane to generate their lift we use the solar uh, energy to create our lift. So a balloon could go up whenever, but you guys need that solar energy, which is going to build Correct. up as the day proceeds. They like to fly early in the morning as a general rule because it's calm and there's not a lot of turbulence. How long have you been flying? Well, I started in 1952 as a college student, and then uh, later I became affiliated with Soaring in 1972 or three. And you're a member of the St. Louis Soaring Association? I am. Give our audience some understanding about that organization and what it does before we talk about soaring itself. Well, the St. Louis Soaring Association uh, began in St. Louis uh, out in the Chesterfield Bottoms. And as uh, time passed and uh, urban sprawl moved in upon them, they were forced uh, to leave and they uh, moved to Alton and then Alton to Highland here and uh, we now own this particular uh, facility due to the generosity of a man by the name of Howard Blossom. Uh, Howard Blossom is uh, renowned as an educator and has done many great things for aviation education and one of those being soaring. Well let's talk about the basics of soaring then because we're dealing with the science behind flight. So soaring is the search for thermal lifts, right? That's correct. Well, let's start with some of the basic information. What is soaring and what are the most commonly used sources for lift? Well, soaring primarily is using the air currents that we find in nature in order to raise and to sustain the glider. There are three types of lift that we find commonly. There are thermal lift, which is a warm air rising. We have ridge lift, and ridge is created by a, uh, a hill the air blowing across that hill, uh, generating lift on the windward side. And then we have what's called wave lift. And wave is generated over the mountains or extremely high hills. Uh, the areas of greatest uh, pro uh, dominance or predominant lift for wave are the Sierras along the, uh, in the Rocky Mountains. Okay. Uh, we also have wave lift in South America, in Chile, and uh, some uh, minor areas along the Allegheny ridges, and as well as uh, in Tennessee in an area called Chihuahua. So, uh, well, let's talk a little bit about thermal lift. Is it like 
Is it similar to what I think about in terms of a thunderstorm, how it goes up and around and causes that, though obviously you're not going to fly in the middle of a thunderstorm? It is very similar. The, the sun heats the Earth's surface. The surface of the Earth heats the air. Warm air being less dense than cold air rises. As that air rises, we look for that in order to keep our sailplane up. As the air rises, it cools. And as it cools, the moisture in the air begins to condense. As it condenses, it forms a cloud. A lot like when you walk out of the house in the morning in the winter and you breathe out, you see this mist that turns uh, foggy uh, mm -hmm. very quickly. Same thing is true with the cloud as it ascends. Since we have air rising, then that forces air from the sides to be drawn in, to be heated again, and to rise. And so you get the circulation that you see in this particular slide, where it's a continual circulation, air being heated, rising, cools, condenses, falls back to the earth, being sucked in and rises again. Well, as we continue to look at some of these images and talk about basic atmospheric concepts, how much of, how much of meteorology and that kind of thing does a soaring pilot need to be aware of? Well, I don't know if a meteorologist, he doesn't need to be a meteorologist, he just needs to understand the basic principle of convective uh, lift. And uh, if he can do that uh, with some de high degree of success, then he's a great soaring pilot. And for those who don't know, a convective lift is? Warm air rising. rising. And of course, depending on the, uh, the rapidity at which that lift rises, it could form into rain showers, and in the summertime, you see these massive cumulative nimbuses out there, mm -hmm. and those are thunderstorms, and uh, they become very violent. And so in our gliders, we uh, make a very conscientious effort to avoid that kind of convective lift because it exceeds probably the structural and design capability of the airplane. Now, our next image refers to a column and bubble. Let's talk about that and how you utilize that idea. The, uh, the column of lift is as we described initially, and you see it on your left, your right, probably my left. But uh, nevertheless, as that air rises, it, the heat from the surface continually creates this rising air. And so a sailplane can fly anywhere above the surface up to the base of the cloud in that area, that column of air. The other image there is called a bubble. And what happens is that the it, the sun heats the earth, earth heats air, but then the winds aloft, we always have circulation aloft, will move that cloud away from its heat source. Mm. And then there's nothing to continue to heat it, so it forms a, a kind of an isolated bubble. And there is a certain amount of lift directly beneath that cloud, but if you're too low, then the lift has disappeared because no heat source. And depending upon how hot it is actually during the day and what the air temperature is, I mean, will that, ex will that create the width of the thermal lift as well as the height of it? Like how, how wide across is like that thermal lift and bubble going to be? Well, it depends on the heat source. You know, if you have, uh, again, something like a, uh, a, a small uh, uh, heat source, it generates a small amount of lift. Uh, if you have a very large source, uh, like a, uh, a bonfire, mm -hmm. it creates a lot more lift. Walmart parking lots generate a lot of lift because they're dark and they're large. Mm -hmm. And so the thermal above a parking lot like Walmart will be huge. And that would be better than like if it was the same size as farm field as it was to compare to a Walmart lot, the Walmart lot would be better than a farm field for creating the lift? Because it, it probably is darker and absorbs more heat. Okay. You know, and it's a large surface area. As we look at the next image, we talk about some additional things just about the, to make sure people understand thermal lift. Let's go through this, Mel, and talk about what's happening here. Well, this shows the uh, cumulus-type clouds that are formed by thermal-type lift, by rising air. Uh, they resemble little white, puffy cotton balls that you see basically in early spring and throughout the summer, and they haven't developed into these huge cumulal nimbuses. Uh, they primarily uh, occur in this fashion after a cold front goes through. And uh, you'll see the sky is very blue and the clouds are puffy. And uh, the, they'll form, if you can stare at the picture, you'll see that the winds aloft can 
push those clouds together and they form what's called a cloud street. And so if you fly or parallel to that street, you would be in thermal lift the whole time. And we also mentioned at the very beginning that it's not just thermal lift that's also an option for you, it's ridge lift and it's wave lift. And so let's talk about that as well. Ridge lift is going to occur over like lower hills? Yes, if you have any type of a, uh, a series of hills that are together, then the air that blows up the slope creates lift on the windward side. But we could also mix that with thermal lift, that is the sun heating the surface would generate thermal lift as well. So, but to be effective, you know, there are very few ridges in the state of Illinois, <laughs> <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but uh, you need to have, in order to be able to fly along the ridge, you'd have to have a ridge that was probably a half to a mile, maybe five miles long, so that you could fly along the ridge in one direction reverse your course and then fly back along the ridge. So normally ridge lift is, involves long ridges. And of course we have the Alleghenies that run a thousand mm -hmm. miles along the east coast. Uh, Chihaui is a ridge. Uh, there's one up in Tennessee, I mean up in uh, uh, Kentucky. And so there's a number of places where we have ridge lift, but it's not as predominant as thermal lift. And wave lift, which you mentioned in the Sierra Nevadas, that's all, I mean, it, is it because the mountains are bigger and the range could obviously be longer that we're going to get higher and be able to fly for a longer period of time with wave lift than we could with regular thermals? Absolutely. All of the, uh, uh, the records in soaring are created in wave lift. Uh, the uh, air blowing across the mountain range uh, sets up a series of waves downwind, primary, secondary, tertiary waves that flow, and they go up to uh, 30,000 feet mm. uh, and even higher. So uh, uh, it's interesting to note that uh, uh, Steve Fawcett set the newest world record in Australia by flying in wave lift, and it's 50,000. 239 feet. My gosh. Uh, at all, the result of being in wave. Wow. Now, so, uh, for those of us who are interested in looking at videos of that, the Soaring Association of, of, Soaring, so, Amer Soaring Association of America website, SAA.org, has a variety of great videos where they show ridge flying, they show wave flying, as well as, as cross country flying. So feel free to go to that website to look more at that. Let's talk about this plane then, because obviously we're going to use those scientific concepts to be able to navigate once we're up there. We'll talk about that navigation process more. But we obviously have to get up there, so we want to talk about some of the physics concepts too. But to begin with, let's just look at this thing in terms of how it's designed. How is a sailplane designed to take advantage of what we just talked about, the idea that it's searching for thermals? Well, it's lightweight, normally. Sailplane weighs about 550 pounds. And when you put a pilot in there, it's about 880 pounds, 890 pounds. So it's relatively lightweight. It has a long wing. The aspect ratio is long and thin, and it creates lift. And so uh, being long and thin, it has a ratio, uh, a high aspect ratio as far as lift is concerned. This particular airplane will travel 38 miles for every mile that you're up. Oh. So if you climb up a mile, uh -huh. you can fly 38 miles. And that's calculated on the basis of its size and its wingspan? Yes. Okay. And the curvature of the wing okay. would also do that. They have other uh, sailplanes that uh, obviously have lesser numbers than that, but also some that have much higher numbers. And the uh, uh, really high performance sailplanes might have a ratio of 60 to 1. Oh my gosh. So for being a mile in the air, you could travel 60 miles. We had received some email questions in advance uh, from students across the country uh, for this program. And, and one of them comes from Braden, who's um, in actually Medicine Lodge, Kansas. And he wants to know the average wingspan for a glider plane. I mean, because there's different sizes. Is there like a basic average wingspan that would be a one-seater like yours is? No, not really. Uh, it, you think of it in the same terms as the way cars are designed. Okay. Uh, they all have a purpose. This is a 15-meter class, 
Uh, everything in this particular hangar is 15 meters. Okay. But they also have 17 meter airplanes, they have 20 meter airplanes and 22 meter airplanes. And of course, if you have an airplane that has a 22 meter wing on it, then you're going to have a much higher glide ratio. And so those would probably be the uh, 60 to ones or that type of thing. Now the planes we're seeing here are obviously all put together. Yes, they are. And, but you could potentially travel with this plane and it comes apart? It does. And uh, there go are ahead. two massive pins in here that you remove, then the wing comes off, this wing comes off, and the horizontal stabilizer comes off, and we have a trailer, excuse me, that's designed to put the fuselage in there. It's on a dolly, and you simply uh, slide it into mm -hmm. the trailer. That each of the wings fit on dollies, and they slide into the trailer and uh, then the tail. You close it up, hook it to your car, and drive off. Well, we've got some video for our audience so they can see how that is assembled and how that happens. It's from Out and About, which is a video that's available via the Soaring Association website. Let's take a look at that video now. I can have the glider ready to fly in less than Oh, Out and Return, I believe, is the name, if I recall correctly. Yes, Out and Return. I'm wearing a bib because the end of the wing has some really greasy fittings. Each wing panel weighs about 140 pounds and this dolly is really handy. If I didn't have the dolly, another person would have to help me put the wings on. No tools are needed to assemble the glider. The wings and fuselage are held together by this one large steel pin. The glider is constructed entirely of fiberglass. It weighs about 600 pounds and has a wingspan of 57 feet. After the glider is assembled, I use tape to cover up the gaps between the wings and the fuselage to prevent air from leaking in or out. This helps the performance of the glider and also makes it quieter inside. Next, I do a pre-flight inspection to make sure the sailplane is properly assembled and that everything is working properly. idea about how that's put together and uh, to give you a visual for what Mel and I were just talking about. Now there are some unique glider characteristics that we can show in an image here that make it important for some people to understand about how gliders work. Let's talk a little bit about what we're going to see on this slide as well here. In terms of construction, you mentioned the fact that most of the time it's glass fiber and carbon fiber, but you can have metal or wood glider planes as well? That's true. Most uh, home-built gliders, or a lot of home-built gliders are made from wood. And originally, all gliders were built from wood, and the evolution was to metal and then into the uh, carbon or the fiberglass and carbon fibers. Now, I, I noticed the information that says it produces a high amount of lift at low angles of attack. Tell me what that means. Well, the angle of attack is the re relationship of the wing to the air. Okay. And so as you tip the wing up and the air hits lower on the surface, it has a higher angle of attack. So it's the relationship of the wing, the cord, to the air, relative right. wind. Now, one of the concepts that's an important part of, of physics related to this is the concept of drag. And so does the angle of the wing affect the ability of the plane to deal with drag and go through the drag? Uh, yes and no. Okay. Uh, all lift produces drag. All right. And our goal is to produce more lift than drag obviously that's why we have a higher glide ratio and so everything that we do uh, is focused on creating more lift than drag a good example of the type of drag that we have on a sailplane if you could visualize a, uh, a person water skiing when he's in the water and the boat begins to pull him you'll notice that there's huge waves mm -hmm. and that's because he's at a high angle of attack uh, 
relative to the water or okay. relative to the wind, and it creates enormous induced drag. As he goes faster, you'll notice that the plane, he begins to plane, right? Uh huh. And the uh, wake is less, so he has less induced drag. And when he is going 35 or 40 miles an hour, then he's just skimming on mm -hmm. the top of the surface, there's very little wake behind him, and so he has little induced drag. And the same thing is happening too in the air, we just don't get to see the wave, so to speak. That's true. That's what, at high angles of attack, you have high induced drag, and so therefore we need to fly at the most efficient airspeed. In this particular airplane, the most efficient speed would be 50 miles per hour. We're going to have a chance to see that flying because we had the chance to come out earlier and get uh, uh, Mel in a different sail plane than his own um, flying and we have visuals that we can give you from both the ground looking up as well as from the plane itself. But before we take to the air, we want to begin to look at the instrumentation and the panels that are in here because I suppose everybody would want to be safe and make sure they know how this puppy operates before they get up in the air because I'm like, okay, it's me in a 55 pound thing. Um, so let's talk a little bit of what we're seeing here and just identify for us what, we're, what we've got. Well, this being the instrument panel, mm -hmm. on this side we have our airspeed indicator. It tells us how fast we're going. These two are variometers which would tell us the rate of climb or the rate of descent. And actually, we have an audio variometer which by sound changes its pitch in order to tell us whether we're climbing or descending. And here we have an altimeter which tells us how high we are. Okay. It works just like a clock. The big hand tells us the hundreds of feet, just like a clock tells us minutes. The little hand tells us thousands of feet, just like the big hand tells us hours. And so we read it the same way. Right now we're at 540 feet. If the hand passed the surface, it would be one. We'd read it as 1,540 feet. feet. Okay. Uh, we have a radio. Uh, we have a number of other things a microphone so that we can communicate with other people. And here we have a PDA, which is programmed with a program called SOAR Pilot. And this program will constantly compute and update your uh, flight path, uh, your speed. It will uh, compute the amount of lift that you have. And by meshing it all together in a program, will tell you how much altitude you need in order to reach your desired goal. And this is your steerer? This is a stick that controls your ailerons. And in the front, there are two pedals uh -huh. which control the rudder. Flying the glider is much, it's similar to riding a bicycle or a motorcycle. If you want to turn, you basically just lean it over and you would do that by moving the stick to the right. Okay which leans the airplane over, and then the rudders would control or would coordinate that amount of turn. And so when you want to straighten up, then you move the stick in the opposite direction. And really and truly, it's very, very similar to riding a bicycle. Well, let's get people into the air and see what it's going to be like now that we've talked a little bit about this. We've got video which shows the, you getting up in the air, how the tow plane works, and there's a variety of ways that you can actually launch uh, a sailplane, and we'll talk about those methods, but here, for your purposes, you're using a tow plane, correct? Correct. We use the aerial tow method uh, in order to launch our sailplanes. And we, we had a question that came from Josh in Medicine Lodge as we begin to talk about, as we look at this video come out and we see that the, the tow plane, uh, the plane's going to come out and the, the glider's going to come behind it. Basically, how much thrust is needed to overcome the drag of an airplane, to make it go? Is there some sort of like physics formula or scientific formula that helps you determine thrust versus drag? No, uh, uh, not really. Uh, obviously, the, the tow plane, the tug we call it, has to have enough lift for it to fly. And if it's certificated to fly, yep. then it probably has enough power to pull a tow plane because the, the weight of the tow plane is relatively light Okay. And once you begin uh, moving, the glider is creating lift on its own, so it's not like dragging a thousand pounds of dead weight. Okay. Well, let's, yeah. let's begin to see that happen, because we've got video for everybody of the tow plane operating and making that happen. So let's go to that video and talk about the speed as we look at this. You know, so how fast is the tow plane going to get off the air? What's the speed we're dealing with here? 
The tow plane will uh, probably lift off the ground around 50 knots. Uh, we strive to climb at 65 knots of airspeed, or about 70 miles an hour, plus or minus. And that's primarily because of the uh, limits which are placed on the glider. Mm. We don't like to tow more than, in fact, this is restricted to 87 knots as okay. far as the tow is concerned. And here, obviously, we're seeing it from the perspective of the pilot because we had the opportunity to be both in the plane as well as show it from the ground. And um, you're going to tow together, and then at some point, there's obviously going to be a release. The, the, the tether's going to be released, and we've got video of that that we can share with everybody as well. Talk about that process. I assume the tow plane's going one way, and you're going to go the other, so we, we don't That's hit it. correct. We, we tow to lift is the word. And so when we encounter lift, then we want to separate ourselves from the tow plane. And instead of using the plane for uh, towing or generating the lift or climbing, we want to use our own. We want to use nature to do that. The tow rope would snake out in front. The tow pilot can sense that. He would turn left and descend in order to gain separation. And we would turn to the right and climb. And that way, by the glider going one direction, or the, glider, the tow plane going one, the glider the other, we ensure separation. And that's exactly what we were able to see in that video. And then, of course, we saw you uh, piloting that plane. Now, for a jet, uh, Brandon's question deals with commercial jets. For them to overcome drag and get the thrust, that's what they're using their engines for? Yes, absolutely. And is there a certain amount of, I don't know, RPM or power that needs to happen for a basic everyday passenger airplane to get off the ground? How much, how much thrust am I creating to overcome that drag? Well, it's a thrust always has to exceed drag okay. and lift always has to exceed the force of gravity. And so if you have greater gravity and greater drag, then the airplane won't fly. Uh -huh. So the ratio needs to be you have to have greater thrust than drag greater lift than gravity. Now we just saw you obviously being lifted via tow plane. Is that the most used method of, of lifting? In the Midwest it is. However, the uh, probably second most popular method would be a winch tow. And they have a mechanical device with a large drum and a large cable. And they would activate that and the winch would, and the cable would be towing the glider the length of the field. And we do, what's called kiting. You know, if you uh, have ever flown a kite, you run with the string and mm -hmm. the kite goes behind you. You try to get it up as steep as you can. We actually pull against the cable in our glider, which is kiting, in order to get the highest possible altitude before we release. Now, we saw the winch lift there, but there's also something called like automobile launches? They do. Uh, not used very frequently, especially not in the Midwest. You need long runways. Okay. But they do out in the, uh, like in the salt flats, uh, they use a winch tow. Uh, and it's an automobile that can accelerate very quickly. It has a long rope, and uh, they try to get as high as they can, as soon as they can, and release. And the same thing is true. The thing about a winch launch and an uh, uh, automobile tow launch is that you're restricted on altitude. You can only get uh, maybe 1,000 or 1,500 feet. Mm. And then you need to find thermal lift, ridge lift, or some kind of wave lift, or otherwise you're going back for another relight. You're not going to be flying very long. No. Now, when I saw the information that indicated that there were bungee launches, I, of course, immediately referred to, like, bungee jumping, and I thought to myself, hmm, I don't think I quite understand how that's going to work. What's a bungee launch like? It's uh, very similar to a slingshot. Okay. In other words, if you had a slingshot, you put something in it, you hold it back, uh -huh. stretch out the rubber bands or whatever you're using, release it, and it launches the object that you have in the sling, right? Right. Well, the same thing is true with a glider. They have uh, long bungee cords. They put the glider on a hill. People run or walk down the hill and stretch the bungees as uh -huh. far as they can. And when they are at their maximum limit, they release the sailplane and the people holding the bungees run downhill as fast as they can. And that launches the sailplane into the air. So you're using rubber bands in order to get the airplane <laughs> airborne. That's cool. That would be really interesting to see. I'm not quite sure I'd want to 
be the one running down the hill, but that's really cool to see. Well, it would depend on whether how rocky it was or <laughs> all the rest. You know. Now, some sailplanes are actually able to self-launch, correct? They are. They have uh, small uh, uh, engines which are contained in the rear fuselage. Well, actually, some are mounted up front, some are in the rear. Mm -hmm. uh, the two examples we have here both are mounted in the aft fuselage. And it's a small engine that uh, raises up into position and uh, it will have enough power and energy to have you get you airborne. And then once you're airborne, you shut the engine off and the uh, uh, engine retracts into the fuselage, you close the doors and you become a glider. Very cool. Really a neat uh, way to fly. That is a neat way to fly. So we're in the air, we're been tethered the tether has been released and you're going to begin the flight. We've got some wonderful video of male uh, flying. And as we begin to look at this video, uh, we had a question that came from John about sailplane pilot training. There are uh, federal requirements for licensing of glider pilots, uh, private, commercial, or some other advanced rating. And the numbers vary upon the person's ability. In other words, there is a minimum number that's uh, required, but beyond that, it depends on a person's ability. The thing that's very unique about soaring and the glider community is that you're not required to have an FAA medical certificate okay. in order to fly. And the reason is? Or do you know? No, it was just, it's never been required. Uh -huh. And we, we do what we call self-certify. Before okay. we fly, we say, I'm physically capable. I have no known physical defect that would preclude me from operating this airplane safely, and therefore I can go flying. Well, let's be up in the air, because we've seen some video of that, and we've got some images to show people as we go across. In essence, what you're con constantly doing is you're constantly looking for that thermal, right? There's constantly. The, there's the... I'll have thermal, I'll have lift, and there'll be some sink that'll occur between, and I'm looking for another thermal. So I want to try, to, I'm going to get into the center of the thermal and then depart the thermal. I'm constantly going up and down searching? Constantly. The, uh, the, the keys is to successful soaring would be to first locate the thermal, then be able to center the thermal so we enjoy the maximum amount of lift, and then depart the thermal for the next thermal. A thermal, if you could visualize it, is a lot like a funnel. Okay. And so when we say fly in the thermal, we're flying around the inside of that funnel. And the uh, strongest amount of lift is in the center of that thermal, or that funnel. And so therefore, we're always working to get ourselves into the strongest part of that thermal. And, and, and remind the audience again, how do you know when you're in the strongest part of the thermal? What instrumentation is telling you that? Well, I have an audio variometer, which uh -huh. would tell. I could read on there. I could also hear it. And uh, generally speaking, uh, strong thermals in the Midwest would be going up five, six, seven hundred feet a minute. Okay. You could have a thousand foot a minute thermals, uh, but they're rare. If you were in wave lift or in ridge lift, you could be going up a thousand or fifteen hundred feet a minute. So okay. they're really significantly stronger. Now our next image continues to talk about thermals, and, and this is where we, you, we talked about some of the things we mentioned before, uh, the difference between like a green field, a brown field, or like blacktop. Um, and obviously if you're traveling over a big lake, like lake, if I was over the middle of the lake of the Ozarks, would that be a good or a bad thing? Would I get a lot of thermal because of the reflection of the sun and the heat rising? Bad. 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 Stay away from water. Okay. Uh, water in the fields after heavy rains uh -huh. destroys the ability of the sun to heat the Earth's surface. Okay. Water tends to have a constant temperature uh, day and night. Uh, yes, water warms from early spring to midsummer to late fall, but uh, it doesn't change day night very often. To have successful thermals, we need to have a day night differential in the neighborhood of 20 to 25 degrees. So okay. We would like the temperature at night to be, say, 65, and the temperature during the day to be 90. Uh, but we could also soar in the winter time if the temperature was zero last night and it got up to 35 or 40 degrees today. We have the same uh, effect of the sun heating the surface and the surface being able to heat the air 
less dense, or warm mm. air is less dense and it rises. So it doesn't make any difference whether it's winter or summer. The thing you look for is the temperature differential. It's supposed to be like 91 or 92 degrees here in, in St. Louis today. So off the top of my head, I would think that would be a good day. But if it was the middle of summer and we only got down to like 80 degrees at night, it wouldn't be. It Bad is day. the variation that matters for you. Right. Uh, it was relatively cool last night. And uh, so we'll have some thermal lift today, but it won't be nearly as strong. Uh, tomorrow should be a booming day because we're having a cold front go through. We'll have a lot of dry air this evening, and then we'll have heat tomorrow. And so we'll see a lot of those puffy Q that we okay. saw earlier. Now, we've mentioned, we've mentioned sinks, and we've got an image that talks about sinks, the loss of the thermal, the sink back and forth. Bad. Bad, bad. Sinks are bad Stay things. Stay away from sink. So, but unfortunately, if you recall, we described the thermal action as air rising, cooling, and then falling again and being heated and back in. So whenever you have thermal lift uh, surrounding it, you have sink. And since there are fewer heat sources, there'll be fewer thermals, but greater lift. And so as a result of that, you need to climb in lift and then race across the areas of sink in order to find the next area of lift. And what you're doing out here in Highland is what's called cross-country soaring. We do cross-country soaring. All right. Here. And we've got an image that talks about cross-country soaring and how you go about that process of sure. searching and from place to place. Sure. And you can see here that there are three distinct areas there. The first one shows a thermal where you have lift. And the glider will circle in that thermal until it reaches a height which there is acceptable to them. It may not be the height of the thermal. But then you gain speed and you see them racing across that area of sink into the next area of lift. Once you're in that area of lift, you begin to climb, and it's a continual process, a succession of flying and lift, crossing sink, flying and lift. Now, how do you maintain going forward and making sure you're going in the right direction? We've got some, some video of you flying again. When we see this, this string uh, looking through here, is, is this helping you determine direction and, and, and wind and stuff? Or like oh, this no is what's called with? the yaw string. Okay. It determines uh, whether or not you are in coordinated flight. Which means? Coordinated flight means that uh, the airplane is, uh, a good analogy might be if you were to use a, uh, a ball on the end of a string and you were twirling it around, as long as you twirl it fast enough, that is to overcome the weight of the ball, the string will stay out horizontally. If you slow down, the ball will begin to drop. Okay. Or if you spun it really quick, the ball would begin to rise. The glider, when it's in a turn, you're in what's called a 1G, the force of gravity, one times. And you set upright in your seat, you feel very comfortable. But the airplane, as it turned, it could slide or fall in, you'd be in a slip and that would be indicated by this. Okay. It, you could be going too fast and it could also skid and that would be indicating that you're going too fast. This would be in the opposite direction. And so in order to fly in coordinated flight, maximize the lift on the airfoils, we always like to fly coordinated. As we, as, we, as, we look, as we saw that video and we look at the next video, which is going to show you flying through the clouds, on a typical good sailplane flying day, how long are you going to be able to stay up? Uh, as long as there is daylight. Okay. And as long as there is lift. All right. So each now, of these clouds represents places that would be thermals? Yes. Those are like gas stations in the sky. Okay. Uh, every time there is a cloud, there was a heat source, and the heat source formed that cloud. Sometimes that cloud moves away from the heat source, bubble lift, we saw that, or if it's a continual column, then we find lift underneath it. But all of these uh, that you see represent thermal lift, and, uh, and they'll be, uh, as I say, it's like a gas station in the sky. It's where you can gain altitude. And talk for a little bit just about the sensation for you. What's the exciting thing about being in the air in this kind of plane? It's using your skill uh, to, uh, you match your skill with what nature provides. The ability to uh, find lift 
to use a natural phenomena, so to speak, uh, to climb, to fly, to stay aloft. Uh, here in the Midwest, uh, it's not uncommon, but it's not rare either to stay up five or six hours. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, travel uh, anywhere from 25 miles to a couple hundred miles away from home. And it's just the, the, the sensation that you have to have nature help you in order to fly. It's a, it's a really exhilarating experience. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, uh, when uh, Captain Sully landed that airplane mm -hmm. in the Potomac, uh, or rather in the Hudson, everybody thought that was just a masterful piece of airmanship, and it was. However, we land every day without an engine, and we don't appear on TV. So uh, it's that challenge that uh, really makes you feel good. Well, we've got some video of you landing, though, that we're going uh -oh. to be able to show the audience now. And talk about that landing process, because one of the questions I have is, you're up there, and what if, what if you, what if the thermals or whatever don't let you get back to the airport? Well, then you land in a cornfield. Okay. Or you land in a hay field. Uh -huh. Hopefully. Actually, the choices would be to land on a hay field, then in a soybean field, then in a corn field that had been, uh, where the crop had been removed. Harvested, uh-huh. <laughs> and the last thing you'd land would be in where corn is grown. So what are you doing here as you begin to, like, come down toward the ground? Uh, what's happening with your feet or the design, or what are you noticing? Well, I'm simply uh, uh, controlling the airplane. I, basically, all I'm doing is controlling the rate of descent. Okay. And I do that through the spoilers, which are located on either wing. And so I either pull the spoilers up to destroy lift, or lower them to regain lift. And by using that process, I adjust the height of the airplane in order to land. The opposite of a power plane, where you would add power or take off power, mm -hmm. we add spoilers to eliminate drag or lower it to increase lift. A question that we'd gotten from Tim in Medicine Lodge relates both to what you talked about in terms of pilot solely as well as the landing right here. If a commercial engine, a commercial jet loses its engines, What's, its, what's the process then? Can it operate basically like a cell plane? How much distance do you have to go and what would you do to deal with that? I'm not sure what the glide ratio would be, but okay. it, it certainly uh, has a glide ratio. And, you know, it might be uh, three to one, uh -huh. you know, for every mile up and go three miles or something similar to that. Uh, but the sail plane, if we were a mile up, would go 38 miles. Oh, okay. So there's a significant difference between mm -hmm. the, uh, the glide ratio of an airplane. And, of course, each airplane would be different, whether it was a general aviation airplane, uh, just a passenger airplane, or whether it was a commercial airliner. And, you know, the Challengers, when they return from space, mm -hmm. they're gliders. Right. They the have space no shuttle power. returns as a glider. Absolutely. And so, but their glide ratio is certainly not as high as mine are as you'd find in a commercial airplane. Wow. But they're gliders too. Fascinating. It is. It's, it's great. So now, let's say I'm fascinated by this and I want to learn how to glide. Can I just come out here and get lessons? How, how would I become a, a soarer? Well, we are a club and so you have to become a member in order to, be, to learn to fly mm -hmm. here at Highland. However, throughout the uh, U.S. and throughout the world, there are also commercial glider establishments, and you can simply uh, make an appointment and buy a glider lesson and learn to fly. If you go to the Soaring Safety uh, of America's website, ssa.org, you can find places throughout the United States in order to fly. And there's a link on the left side, you click it, and you'll find that there's places all over uh, the West Coast, East Coast, and uh, throughout the Midwest, both clubs and commercial operations. And I understand that uh, if youth are interested in flying, there's an FAA website or some sort of FAA link that kids can learn more about youth flying? There is. You would want to go to uh, www.fastteamyouth.gov. Gov, I think. Gov. And on that site, it's a site for youth. You would uh, register, and uh, there's a place where uh, if you uh, complete certain uh, basic requirements, you could actually get a free lesson to fly. And uh, one final question that comes from Brian in Medicine Lodge. Do bags fly free mail? They do in this airplane. <laughs>
<laughs> However, you can see from the baggage compartment know, where I have like, the radio uh -huh. that the size is even more restricted than it would be on an airline. So my, my carry-on and uh, on, uh, I won't mention any airlines, my name, but my carry-on that would go up above won't fit in here. I've got to have a much smaller little backpack or whatever. Well, there's, there's there. enough room to put a shaving kit in there. Oh, well, then if you land in the middle of a farm field and you need to sleep overnight in your plane and want to be fresh in the morning, you can do absolutely. that. Absolutely. Thanks absolutely. so much, Mel. This has been absolutely fantastic. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us, and thanks to everybody for being here as part of the science behind flight, Soaring the Sky. We look forward to connecting with you again.